Welcome to part four of our five part series on plantar fasciitis. In part four, we're gonna explain what we believe is the real cause of many cases of plantar fasciitis and our reasoning behind it. Hey, it's Glenn here from Mehab, the world's leading physical therapy alternative, where we educate and empower you to take control of your recovery. If you're new here, make sure you click that subscribe button and all the links we mentioned in the video can be found in the description below. As always, this information is meant for educational and demonstration purposes only. With that out of the way, let's get into it. The plantar aponeurosis, aka the plantar fascia, and the underlying intrinsic muscles are incredibly close in anatomic location. So close in fact that it's very difficult to separate the two in cadaver dissection. And while these intrinsic muscles have specific functions related to the movements of the toes, they also assist the plantar fascia in supporting the arch of the foot. Plantar intrinsic foot muscles provide stability, shock absorption, and help transfer ground forces efficiently. The location and function of plantar intrinsic muscles and the plantar fascia are so closely related it is impossible to isolate them. There are many muscles in the foot, but three muscles are directly connected to the plantar fascia. The flexor digitorum brevis, abductor hallucis, and the abductor digiti minimum. During walking and running, these muscles contract during weight transfer to the forefoot and toes, assisting in propulsion, providing stability to push off. These muscles are placed under high load repetitive forces with every step, and these forces are further increased with running. The attachment of these muscles, the calcaneal tuberosity, also happens to be the exact location that some people develop heel spurs, and it's also the point where providers press to diagnose plantar fasciitis. Bone growth and tendon attachments occur when there is repetitive contraction of a muscle which pulls on the bone. This type of bone growth usually occurs in high load bearing attachments like the foot or the knee. Common examples are auschwitz schlatter's and Severs disease. It seems likely that the plantar pain at the heel is just if not more likely to be due to the plantar muscles repeatedly pulling on the bone. Heel spurs are shown to have a poor relation to plantar fasciitis and actually occur deep or below the plantar fascia. As discussed in part three, while some diagrams have the plantar fascia starting right at the medial calcaneal tuberosity, it also extends further attaching to the heel bone below the fat pad of the heel. The plantar aponeurosis does have some fiber attachments around the medial aspect of the calcaneal tuberosity. However, by design, its attachments are spread out so that it can disperse the forces over a greater area. This helps protect it from being damaged. Think of one person standing on a bridge trying to hold up a car with one rope versus 50 people each holding a rope attached to the car. With 50 points of contact, there is less focal stress, and it's much easier to hold up the car as each person takes on part of the stress. Because of this, the plantar fascia and its larger surface area attachments are much less likely to suffer injury. Additionally, the plantar fascia, or aponeurosis, by design is an incredibly fibrous structure capable of tolerating high and repetitive stress. Based upon the suspect reliability of the diagnoses, the unclear causes of plantar fasciitis, and the structure of the plantar aponeurosis, I believe a majority of plantar fasciitis diagnoses are in fact a proximal plantar intrinsic tendinopathy. This is the result of damage to the tendon or tendons of the plantar foot muscles and not the plantar fascia. There is little crossover in the treatments and the treatments for plantar fasciitis have little to no effect on proximal plantar intrinsic tendinopathy. This also helps explain why people struggle with it for such a long time. Plantar fasciitis treatments are not effective for a tendinopathy. So let's do a quick review. We have a condition whose causes are not entirely clear, other than that it appears to be related to overload or overstretching. Its diagnostic criteria are flawed, relying on palpation and imaging studies with a four millimeter thickness standard that has been proven to appear in people without pain. The underlying intrinsic muscles are directly connected to the plantar fascia and perform some of the same functions, and finally, the treatments used for plantar fasciitis have minimal effect. With all that, it seems more than likely that providers are mistakenly diagnosing plantar fasciitis when it is more likely to be a proximal plantar intrinsic tendinopathy. All right, we've given you a lot to digest over the last few videos, but we hope that it has made sense so far. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comments and we'll do our best to answer them. We have one video left, and that's the one that's gonna help you understand why you can't seem to get rid of it and what you should be doing to speed your recovery. Make sure you don't miss it by hitting subscribe and the notifications bell. If you're finding this information helpful, please give us a like. Thanks for watching and we'll catch you on the next one.